Today on Rambling About Cars, we're discussing the new EPA proposal. Lots to talk about. There is a significant reduction in emissions. We're talking about it for better or for worse, for the good, the bad, and the ugly. Speaking of which, we got BMW XM label red. Did I just make that segue? I didn't mean to BMW. I'm sorry. We've got Integra Type S, an interesting SUV from India and more. So let's roll. It's podcast time. I am Christopher Smith. And it's always, always a pleasure to introduce co-host Mr. Chris Bruce. And it's just hey, us everybody. This week. It is just us this week. Um, I we've got a uh, guest tentatively on the docket for next week. Not a confirmation, mm-hmm. but I've been talking to this person, so probably going to have a guest next week, unless you know things fall through. But yeah, uh, first time we're going to doing a live show where it's just you and I. Which or no, we it was just us last week, wasn't it? Because I was no, I forgot no, Anthony no, was two we, weeks ago. We, no, no, we had Anthony on last week. That was last week when we had Anthony. Time okay. flies, man. Time does um, get weird. Yeah. And and yeah, if you if you missed it, here's I mean, thanks for the segue, Bruce. If you missed Lax last week's show, no worries. Go to Motor One on YouTube, Motor One's YouTube channel. We've got all of our podcasts there where you can watch um the, the, the live shows that we've been running here. And also, if you're listening, whether you're with us on YouTube. Twitter, Facebook, all on Motor One's feeds, Motor One on Facebook, Motor One Com, Motor One Com on Twitter. You can comment with us live right now. If you're listening right now, you can comment and please do. We want to bring you on board with the chatter. We want to bring you on board with the ramble. Um, and we have we have some interesting stuff to talk about this week. And I'm looking forward to some of the discussion here. Um, I, I see we already have a commenter, Groupie FBC morning from Australia, gents. Yeah, Welcome. I was trying to do the math in my head. What From is it, Australia. Like 6 a.m. there, something like that? It's- I've got a, a friend of mine that I met um, in, in a previous professional work life. Uh, this big car guy is down in Australia. Huge, huge car guy. And I am so jealous that he gets to surround himself with 70s Falcons and the Holden Moneros. I, I'm a big fan of those cars. Um, LL Bro is on here now. Ooh. Hi, guys from Nigeria. Gotta, Thanks for joining us. We've got a global audience today, Bruce. Yeah, it's new. Oh, 9.30. So uh, thank you, LL Bro. But Group of FBC says it's 9.30 a.m. there. So it's... what's How's the future? Do we have flying cars yet? Come on. No, no, we don't. The Can only flying cars... lottery numbers. I could really make some money here. <laughs> That's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. That's not how time you. travel works. <laughs> Anyways, anyway. well, we're going to... Before we jump into the news, we're just going to take a little bit of time, uh, let, let some viewers join us here. Um, Kevin Hawthorne, good evening from Lakeland, Florida. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, Bruce, before we jump into the heavy news, how about something a little lighter? You were mentioning um, some 50s and 60s British sports cars. Why don't you tell us a little well, bit about I, that? Well, I was, and this this comes directly from Motor One's chat. Oh, we got Ted Adam Green. He's uh, Integra Type S. Don't. I'm going to hold this, Ted. Uh, We'll get to, we'll talk to Integra in just a little bit. Um, This, but what I'm talking about, it just, it came from our main chat. And what happened was um, uh, MG, a historic, you know, Mm -hmm. long live brand is now owned uh, by China or by Chinese company, I should say. Um, They uh, are going to be coming out with this roadster called the Cyberster. And it is an electric vehicle. Uh, this came from China's Ministry of Let me make sure I get, China's Ministry, Ministry of, of Industry Infor- and Information Technology. Um, yeah, it's and- a, it's a place where we see a lot of. Uh, I mean, I guess you could call them leaks, but I mean they're they're supposed to be posted there. I don't know exactly how it works. Uh, it's closer China. to like a trademark filing almost. Right. That essentially, right. you're pro- you're protecting the design of your vehicle, kind of like you would with a patent or kind of like you would with a trademark. Mm-hmm. But in this filing, it basically gave us all of the specs about this vehicle. Right. So we know uh, it's got two electric motors, the one in front. It has a normal uh, output of 101 horsepower, uh, max output of 201 horsepower. The one in the back, normal output of 215 horses, max output of 335 horsepower. Um, so fairly powerful. It's pretty hefty, as the folks in our comment mention, it, comment say. It weighs 4,376 pounds. <laughs> a 4,300 pound MG. Uh, a Jeez. 2023 Mazda Miata with a manual gearbox weighs 2,341 pounds. So let's 
call it a 2000 pound difference between a Miata and this MG. And I mean, obviously electric vehicles we know are, are heavier in general, just because of, of the equipment that they have to carry. But I mean, th this sort of spurred a discussion since this isn't an official debut, but it's interesting no. that we have this information already, uh, exactly. you know, and we're talking about MG. I mean, a, a, an iconic name in British motoring, Right. Um, so I was writing up this story mm -hmm. and it got me thinking about MG and kind of the heyday, at least in my mind, the heyday of MG is the 1950s and 1960s, where you had the MGA, the MGB, the T-Series a little bit earlier, and then just the, the heyday of British sports cars in general, whether it's MG, Triumph, you know, Jaguar, XK120 or E-Type. Austin Healy, you know, just Lotus, just so, so many brands. And so I presented it in our, th in our chat while I was writing this up. What if you could own one of these 1950s or 1960s British sports cars, especially a convertible one, which would you pick? Um, and mm. I'm also going to put that out to our audience because I'll show the people real quick while we're gathering some uh, listeners here, uh, the one that I would pick. And then Smith, give me your pick, and then we'll kind of get into some news. How does that sound? That sounds pretty good. Uh, why don't you go ahead? Because I I think I have a little choice that I can share here. Um, yep. I don't know if I don't know if you or our ramblers out there will approve. I might be stretching the rules a little bit. I never stretch the rules, by the way. You uh, always go stretch. You're gonna like show me like like a 1980. <laughs> I don't. I'm trying to think like a 1980 TVR and be like, no, that's that's not. That's not oh, I totally forgot about TVR and and, uh, and anyways, go ahead, go ahead, because we got some big news to get going on here. We do, um, but we also it's just a fun conversation. To yeah, kind of ball roll and break the ice, that type of thing. Um, and if you're listening out there with us right now live, your choice of 50s, 60s British sports cars, hit us in the chat. Let us know. Yeah, because I would. I, I'm. You guys comment and give us examples. I'm going to throw them up in the chat uh, or, you know, throw them up on the site here. Mm -hmm. So my example, have I been sharing this the whole time? I have not. You, yet. you, you have good. not shared it yet. We're still looking at the okay. MG Cyberster, which honestly, it's it, it, that's a pretty good looking car. Yeah, it, it's a good looking uh, so car. So my pick would be Triumph TR3. I love the way that the door slopes down and essentially you can reach your arm out the door and just touch the ground. You know, I, I think it has a really iconic look. It's got those bug eye headlights, kind of like an Austin Healy bug eye Sprite, but it's got a little bit more performance. And I just, those doors make it for me. So I think if, you, if I had to have one, that would be my pick. I mean, that's, that's a good pick. I, it's, it's a timeless pick. Um, I can't really pick it apart. It's, it's about as iconic as you can get. Maybe. Um, do you want to see what I come up with? I do. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me flip over my screen here. Um, technically this is British. I think if, oh, God. if, if you, if you go by the, the history and the development of this car um, and five were produced. Um, so you might have a trouble finding one. XKSS. How about the 65 Ford GT40 oh, come Roadster on. prototype? Come, that's what I would pick. That's what I would pick. As yeah, as usual, there, you're a dirty cheater. No, I'm not. Hey, 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 now. Is there a roof on the car? No. Is There's it from not. the 60s? Yes. It is. Like, what, was it developed at least in part by our friends across the pond? Yes. That would be right. a it yes, checks. also. It and can it, you buy it, them? If if one pops up for auction, sure. It technically fits the uh oh so so it's very funny. Uh Eric Nephron, uh Jaguar E type are too obvious. It's hilarious that you put it that way because it, our that, boss that, and the, our that is always the answer, let's be honest. E -type, our our boss Seth Mirisma said, Isn't Jaguar E type the only choice to this? And so you and Seth uh are clearly on the same page. And you're right. That is a fantastic example. Yeah. I, there's no ignoring the Jaggy type as being an iconic British sports car of the 60s specifically. I, 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 I like you can't pick it apart. It's a fantastic choice. It's, it's, just it's not gorgeous in every single way. And honestly, right. it's it's the one it's the one that I would pick. It's the one I would pick. But everybody picks that. So I had to try to be a little different. Right. Yeah. 
Okay, so we're already getting comments about our next topic, and uh, so I will go ahead and introduce that. Just a fun yeah, little icebreaker. Let's, let's there. jump right in. So, uh, oh wait, hold on. Group of FBC says Austin Healy three thousand. Fantastic choice. Yep, that's Absolutely another good fantastic. one too. Austin like, Healy they, actually came up, I think, in our in our in our team's chat. Did it not, Bruce? It did. That was they, uh, I forget who it was. I think it might have been Brett picked a bug eye sprite rather than the 3000, but the 3000 that's more powerful. Yeah. Uh, big, again, you know. again, that that's almost, that's almost like, okay, how, how can you sure. pick that? Right. It, it's it, what makes the topic so interesting is that there are so many fantastic British sports cars of that era. And that's why it's interesting to you say, you got to pick one because there are so many good ones that you can't really like judge someone for picking one or the other one, because very true. There's so many good ones. Anyway, Moving on to the modern age and moving on to our first topic, the Acura, or I should say the 2024 Acura Integra Type S debuted this mm -hmm. week. Um, so I'm going to pull some photos. And up we knew right we knew it was coming. Um, oh, yeah. We, we knew it was basically going to be a, a Honda Civic Type R uh, with with Acura dress. Um, so it's out. It's official. 320 horsepower from its two liter turbo four. A little bit more than you get from the Civic. Um, Six speed manual only, and I think that's pretty darn cool. Um, what else it's we got? A ballsy it's a, choice, in my opinion. It's for for Acura. I I think yes. you could be. I think you could be correct there because I mean it's being it's being presented as the more upscale, luxurious model. But then again, I mean this is this is decidedly a a enthusiast car. It's totally. a performance oriented car. So I think at least offering it is, is expected going manual only. Yeah. That could be kind of a gutsy move. Um, it's got adaptive dampers. I yep. love that. They, that they point out it's got a thicker front sway bar, two millimeters thicker, just a little bit, but, but, but it's, it's a little bit thicker. Um, four piston Brembo brakes up front. And I mean, it's not just, it's not just the Integra with the, the bigger turbo engine. Um, there's some design changes too, right, Bruce? Yeah, uh, you, basically, uh, the way Acura puts it, everything forward of the A-pillar is completely different. So you've got a completely different front fascia. You get an aluminum hood with a uh, an intake in it, and they say that that has 170% better airflow than the standard one because of that the, uh, the inlet in it. Uh, you've got wider front fenders, um, specifically, let me... So front track on the Type S, 64 inches up front, and... 63 and a half inches in the back and to compare that for the regular integra is 60.5 inches up front so three and a half inch gain 61.6 inches i'm bad at math doing math in my head but it's like two and mm -hmm. what is it 1.8 i let's call it two and a little bit there's bigger. a rounding air <laughs> uh, <laughs> a little, little bit big and i mean it sounds small and i mean it, it is small but that's still, I mean, it's still noticeable when you see it on the street, it's still right. going to be a noticeable difference. It's going to be more noticeable than you would expect just by hearing us rattle off some numbers. And of course, I mean, well, it's looking, you're going to notice it in now. terms of handling, certainly, yep. because you're going to have, it's going to be just a little bit wider. Those wheels are going to be a little bit farther out. It's going to be a little bit more planted. I really like the way that the fenders are flared and the, the fenders are wider than on the regular Integra. But when you look at photos, you don't immediately see it. They're not, you know, big boxy fender flares. It's a fairly subtle little uh, modification, but it's there. No, I, I think, uh, and I mean, long time listeners to rambling about cars will know I've been, I started a little critical on the Integra, uh, but you I, and I both up did. I, I've warmed up to it over time. I think they're making some pretty good choices. And I think this latest um, is really good. I think they just just with the small, the small exterior updates make a big difference. You've got the engine in there with a little more than you're going to get from the from the Civic Type R. So I, there's some decent incentive to say, OK, you know what? That's the hot hats that I want. That's that's what I want. I want the Integra over the Civic. Yeah. Um, so Smith, I, 
I could be completely off my rocker here, and I, I want you to tell me if I am. I was taking a shower, and I was thinking about the new Integra and its relationship, the Integra Type S and its relationship to the Civic Type R. It kind of feels to me the way in the 1980s, the Mercury Capri and the Ford Mustang were, where they shared the same underpinnings. They shared a lot of the same engines, but Mercury gave you arguably, and this is purely my opinion, a little bit more of an aggressive look and also on the interior, a bit more of a luxury, more luxurious interior than what you would get in a Fox body Mustang. Well, I, I mean, you're not completely off your rocker. Um, I mean, the, the Capri, I don't know necessarily that the Capri would be more aggressive. Um, the, I mean, Mercury was certainly presented as being a little bit more upscale. Uh, versus Ford, and generally they were when you when you got inside the car. I mean, they were they were generally they they just felt a, a little more luxurious. Not that they were packed with leather and, and a bunch of equipment, but uh, I mean, it's it's a sound analogy. Um, obviously, Acura is upscale versus Honda, so you're going to be pulling in the you know the, the, you're going to be pulling in those buyers. Um, unfortunately, I I think. We we really need to know the price before I think Which, we can start start making some other some other decisions. You're right, and and that's information that we don't have yet. No, that is the basically we do not know zero to sixty. We do not know top speed, and we do not know price. Otherwise, we know basically everything about this vehicle. Mm -hmm. um, but granted, those are three major things. I do want to back up one second. Uh, just throw out the interior specs to anyone who's curious about that. You get a 10.2 inch digital instrument cluster. You get a nine inch touchscreen uh, that has wireless Apple CarPlay and Android auto support. You get a head up display, you get a 16 speaker stereo, uh, and you get a wireless phone charger. The seats are different than the regular Integra. They have uh, thicker side bolsters. They come heated standard and they have ultra suede inserts in the center. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, 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 there's a little bit of a silence there. I don't really have much more to add. It sounds, it sounds like an attractive car. I really want to take this for a spin. I really want to see what it's like. Um, yeah. I mean, none of them having zero to 60 times. And so I, I don't really care about that at this point. I mean, we know it's going to be very comparable to the Civic Type R, if not a little bit quicker. And, and that's good enough for me at this time. Aside from the price, I mean, if they get, if they get crazy on the price, that that could be that could be a real downer, you know. That could be a real yeah, downer, in this. and that's the that's the question mark right now. Mm -hmm. um, we we don't know. I I mean, I would assume it's going to be more than a Civic Type R, just because it's an it's an Acura rather than a For Honda. Sure. I, but I I don't know how much more. For sure, I can hear Cooper going in the background. He I is. think he, he wants. I, I think I think I think Cooper has an opinion. On the uh, on the Integra Type S, yeah. Well, well, we're we have some we have some things going on here in the chat. Um, Eric Eric Nefron, hopefully I'm getting your name right there. Says 48k. Um, could could we be looking at 48k? I I don't know. I I don't know if that's a if if that's out of the question, or maybe that's even a little low. Is I with, with, yeah, with I, this being with this being accurate? I'll be totally honest. I don't know. Um, mm -hmm. I'm happy. I, I look forward to finding out, but I'll be totally honest with you. I don't sure. know. 48 K doesn't sound insane to me. I would think maybe a, a hair less, but I don't know. So, but we'll wait and see. Like, you yeah, know, we'll wait and see. Well, it, we know this is, we know this is going to go on sale a little bit later this year. So we know pricing information. July. Yeah. Let me double check that production begins in July. In June, sorry. So, so we're yes. it's gonna be a few weeks, and we're gonna find out. Yeah, we we know we're not far away from the pricing info on that. So, in other words, that's that's our rambling way of saying stay tuned. More to come on the Acura Integra Type S. Um, maybe before we move on, do you think there's room to bring back an Integra Type R, Bruce? Do you think they could? They, I mean, this is. Pure one hundred thousand percent speculation, but I mean, when you think of the original Integra, the Type R was always—I mean, that—that's the iconic model. 
the I mean, the GSR certainly has a place among enthusiasts and, and a rightful place in it in its past. Um, so but do you, th- do you is, think there's room for a type R? I OK, I, I am basing this purely on what our uh, our former co-worker Clint Simone uh, told us from a dinner that he had either with Honda or Acura from several, several years ago now. So I don't think I'm talking out of turn here. Honda wants to keep the Type R name for Honda and use Type S on Acuras. To my, that's my understanding. And again, sure. that's several years ago. Mm-hmm. So who knows if that has changed since then? No, I mean it's it's sound logic, um, but it it's just Integra Type I, R is a legendary name, though, exactly. right? Exactly. I mean, that's, that, that's that's that's. Oh, if if I was high up somewhere in Acura and Honda, that's hard to say no to. I mean, I certainly understand that's the, the branding aspect, but that's I mean, you have Integra back. You have the possibility for something with with a little more power, a little bit crisper handling. Boy, that's hard to say no to. I I mean, I, I think I think how the new Type S sells. Uh, I mean, I think they'll certainly be paying attention to see how well this car sells. And if it, and if it's. If it's in high demand, hey, who knows? We'll have to see. Stay tuned, folks. Yeah, yeah exactly. It, it's it may like I am not a marketer. I am not a PR guy. But you just think about Integra Type R and what it means to people of kind of roughly our age. You know, kind of late ish thirties, forties, something like that. Integra type R was huge in the late eighties. Like that was or late eighties, late 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 nineties. Um, like that was a big deal. And to be able to capitalize on that knowledge and that kind of lust for to have one back in the day. And now I've got money and I can have one. Like it just seems like such a no brainer. I mean, to just do it. Think about how many, red R badges you've seen primarily yeah. because of that car. I mean, back in the, I, I mean, I remember cruising in the late nineties, early, early two thousands, you know, in my later college days, I mean, type R badges were popping up on everything ridiculous. Oh um, yeah. And, and, and I bring this up because this might be a neat segue for our next vehicle. We're going to talk about. <laughs> sure yeah it, it totally can yeah let me stop this go ahead and introduce our next vehicle that also has something red to do with it and i will well we're, we're talking now. we're talking about the bmw xm label red um i think i, I mean it's not necessarily new um, well BM, bmw it, it, when they debuted the xm last year they said there would be a label red coming then there were some leaked images of, of Didn't it, it leaked the out. same day the regular one debuted. I, though. I, I think it was leak? the same day, and then they <laughs> and then they offered some immediately, and then they offered some official images, and we knew it was going to be pretty powerful. Um, I mean, they said so right off the bat, but they didn't offer full information. Now we have full information: the BMW right. XM label red. Um, you get red trim. And you get yeah. a little bit more. You get seven. You get seven hundred thirty-eight horsepower, seven hundred thirty-eight pound-feet of torque. Um, that all comes from the four-point-four liter twin-turbo V eight plus an electric motor that's built into the transmission. The electric motor is is, is still the same as it was uh, in the, in the regular XM. Um, the power increase comes through that engine. It's making five hundred and seventy-seven horsepower just on its own. Um, Yep. 553 pound feet of torque just on its own. Of course, it works with the uh, works, works with the electric motor. Goes through the eight speed automatic transmission to all four wheels, zero to sixty. Now you would think it, because this number is kind of shocking to me. <laughs> it it is. Um, well, I, I guess I would be curious to see in what way is it shocking because we're talking about an SUV a decidedly performance oriented SUV with 738 horsepower, 738 pound feet of torque driving all four wheels. BMW says zero to 60 in 3.7 seconds. I mean, that's quick. That feels ludicrous, ludicrously quick for a vehicle of this size. You, you feel that feels ludicrously quick. Okay. Maybe not ludicrous. That's of, 
a vehicle that is this hefty and is kind it i mean this is i mean it's it's a, a, it's, a, special... it's a big boy but we're still talking yeah. about a, a a five a five passenger suv right it, I think it's not it's, it's not it's not a seven seater it's a it's a five no it's, no it's i a know i I think partially it's because of the exterior appearance where it looks like it was styled with a hammer and chisel. Like I, I think because it just looks so kind of monolithic, it looks like a brick going down the road. The fact that it gets to 60 in 3.7 seconds, that's what makes it feel so quick to me. I think it's I, I mean, a combination it's, of the number and the styling. I mean, it it is, I mean, that, that's a fast, that's a fast number. No doubts. Um, when I hear 738 horsepower in a five seater SUV, I guess maybe I'm a little jaded. I'm expecting a little bit more, um, but I got to get a, a shout out to group FBC um, for possibly the best comment of the night. I don't know yet because obviously the vehicle that we're seeing here, it's in like the matte black finish with the red trim given off a team vibes. Yes. Yeah. I, I will not. I, I, I was a fan of that show too. I remember that show from the eighties and I can't believe I didn't make this association yet. And now I can't unsee it. This, this could be, this could be the new a team vehicle. No, I don't B a B a would not drive a BMW. Sorry, but, but I will, I will never, I, I cannot unsee this now the black with the red. Um, and yes, my eyes, the burning, um, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and, and harp on styling. It, it's it's subjective. Styling is subjective. It's I, I don't I don't think I don't think it's it's ugly. Um, I don't I don't think it's necessarily a good looking vehicle. It's it just it to me it just looks like a very big, uh, like like mechanical, purposeful, cumbersome ish design. Um, it, it's not, it's like, it's whatever the opposite of streamlined is. That's what I think of <laughs> yes, what, it what, is, when yeah. I see XM. I mean, it's, it's the opposite of streamlined. It's just, it has big proportions. Um, it has lots of contrasting angles. There are lots of lines. Um, let me put it. This is the way I think of it. The BMW M1. It came out in what 81, so it is over 40 years old. 40 years in the future, I can't imagine looking at this and having the same desire, lust, appreciation that I do for an M1. No, um, and I think a lot of people feel that way. Um, but I mean, this. I, 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 I feel like BMW isn't trying to make that connection. I feel like other people are. Um, yes, this is a standalone M product, but it, it's not intended to, uh, I think, be a successor to the M1. It's it's intended to just be a new M standalone product, and it happens to be. Uh, it's hard though a, when a the last bulky... standalone M product is the right. M1 now. Right. But I mean, that was many years ago. And obviously, yeah. th this is what people are interested in buying right now. Although I guess you can make the argument that, I mean, the, the M1, uh, Ooh, I, I, I mean, I mean, I, it, it wait, didn't wait, come wait, out wait, as no. a four door sedan, right? We go, we got to talk guys. M1 was a fail. You know that ah. EKG Canadian guys. M1 was a fail. I, I think, no, I sir. think. I, I think from you know from from like a sales standpoint on from BMW a side from a business sure, standpoint I, I could a lot of things fail in terms of business right. turn out to be beautiful right um, I mean I never I was never really on board the uh, the the BMW train to begin with aside from the six series God that car the 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 the, the earlier six series is just amazingly first, yeah. gorgeous in every possible way. Um, I mean, the M1 is cool, but I, I was never really a huge, a huge fan of the M1. Um, I, I also never really got into like the E30, the, the E36, you know, you know, some of the other sort of iconic performance BMWs, if you will. Uh, so maybe, maybe this jump from N1 to XM doesn't affect me, um, in quite the same way it's affecting others. Um, but I mean, it's, it's a sign of the times. It's a big, it is. 
bulky five seater SUV that is just ridiculously fast. Um, it is ridiculously fast that it, you can't argue. It, it's also going to be expensive. We don't know pricing yet. I want to stress we don't, that. We don't but, know pricing yet, but we know we know it's going to be more than one hundred and fifty nine thousand dollars because that's what the regular XM starts at. Right. So yeah. I mean, it's it's it's, it's, it's going to be a pricey vehicle. Like it 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 will be a pricey vehicle. Um, Ted Adam Green, the XM itself is an answer to a question nobody is asking. The red line is just lame. Kudos on the A-team comment. All right, we can get another another thumbs up for the A-team comment. Um, th- you know, that's uh, l- let's discuss that for a minute because I think that's a pretty insightful comment. It's an answer to a question nobody is asking. Um, would you would you but agree I- with that, Bruce? Because if mean, you look at the sales stats. And it seems like every company that comes out with a performance oriented SUV, I mean, they're they just, they're just selling. I mean, I mean, the people that can afford them, they're just jumping right into them. You just nailed it. The people that can afford them, want them. You think about the Bentley Bentayga. We just recently reported that Ferrari is closing the order book order books for the Pura Sangue because they have so many, they have two years worth of orders. So, you know, they, they they are they need to fulfill those orders before they can take more like everything in the segment Austin Martin DBX just these vehicles sell and mm-hmm. from a business point of view what we are just saying that maybe the M1 failed in terms of business I don't think this is going to fail in, as a business right. venture yeah I it, mean it, it could it, be it could be the exact opposite it it may not win a place in enthusiasts hearts but it's probably going to win a place. Um, in the financial statement at BMW, because the I mean the 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 way other performance SUVs are going, this one's probably going to sell. Um, and I mean it's it's also worth noting if you don't like the black with the red trim, BMW is going to offer the uh, the label red in like I think like something like fifty other colors. Um, the black is going to be very limited. The whole model itself is is limited, um, the label red to five hundred. So it's not like you're going to see a lot of these, um, but the the red trim certainly gets your attention. And with the black, God, I I cannot unsee the A team van now. <laughs> There's a really good rear three quarter angle that it, it you could. It looks like the A team van. <laughs> it mm-hmm. really does. It, it it does. And and Eric says the problem I have with it is that its performance has already been eclipsed by its rivals. You're not wrong there. Um, in fact, if you jump over to MotorOne.com to search up quickest SUVs, I just updated our article, uh, our annual article for 2023, um, just just a couple weeks ago. And as I was going down the list, I had I had XM to add. And I couldn't because the XM in its standard form, zero to 60 in what, like four, two or four, three wasn't yeah. fast enough. And we have, uh, that's a list of 20 of the world's fastest SUVs that actually I had to expand to 23 because there was a tie. The entry level point, I think is 3.7 or 3.6 seconds. So even the XM label red, if it does make the cut, and I'm, I should go back and update that, even if it does make the cut, it's right at the very bottom of the world's of the world's fastest SUVs. And when I say fastest, in this case, I'm talking about zero to sixty performance, not top speed, because zero to sixty, that kind of uh, acceleration, that's really the defining performance aspect of the segment. People aren't jumping into an SUV thinking, okay, will this top out at two hundred twenty on the autobahn? that's that's not really the point you're getting in with space for four or five in some cases seven people and some cargo you're flooring the gas and you're getting pinned in, in the seat so that's the metric that we're going by and yeah xm label red even if it makes the list it's right at the very bottom um i mean the the dbx 707 is near i think i think the dbx 707 if memory serves is the quickest uh combustion vehicle on the list uh 
Tesla Model X Plaid, I think, is still is still. If the, you have a second, overall. I can vamp. I was just trying to find it and wasn't able to because I was ahead. trying to look at comments and stuff too. So if you want to look for that real quick, we can. We've got a little bit of time. We could go through it and just kind of show where uh, the label red fits in there. It it's a fascinating segment um, because like it's interesting. It's essentially become what grand tours were. 30 something years ago where, you know, you used to buy a Ferrari 599 or a Testarossa, or I'm trying to think what four seater models. Um, Crap. Uh, Yeah. You know, that there were vehicles like that. And now these performance SUVs have kind of taken that place because they allow you to put in, four or five people and still have tons of speed and tons of performance. But well, I've got it right here, sharing my screen right now. And if you're listening um, later after the live broadcast, motor one.com it's in our features. Um, Just type in fastest SUVs. Um, I think it shows up in our search uh, has, has been from 2020. Um, That's when it was originally published. We have it updated for 2023. So you want to click on that. And yeah, the entry level for the world's fastest SUV on our list, and I, I mean, I spent a, a lot of time trying to make sure I, I got everything plugged in here, is 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. So um, the the label red would be right in there. It, it would be a tie yeah. with a Porsche Cayenne tie. Turbo. Um, it would be a tie with a BMW X3 and X4M. Um, and it would be a tie with the X5M, X6M competition. Um, and it would be a tie with the Maserati Levante Trofeo. Um, then we go, okay, it's also a tie with the RSQ8. All of these are 0 to 60 in 3.7 seconds. Uh, finally, we get to the Alfa Romeo Stelvio Quadrifoglio. Man, I hate trying to pronounce that. But it's 0 to 60 in 3.6 seconds. So, yeah, that I mean, that's... That's how that's how just tightly contested this segment has become. Um, you need zero to sixty in under four seconds to just be at the bottom end of the fastest SUVs in the world. Um, mm-hmm. And then I think we get down here to the fastest. Um, is that still the Model S Plaid? Yeah, that's still the the Tesla Model X Plaid. Sorry, not the Model S, the Model X Plaid. Zero to sixty in two point five seconds. Um, top speed of 163 miles an hour. So, I mean, if you stay, if you're on the Autobahn and you stay on the gas in the label red, um, provided you have the drivers, uh, the upgraded drivers performance package, um, you can get to 174 miles an hour. Sorry, 175. Otherwise, it's limited to 155 miles an hour. So, mm-hmm. um, the fastest. Yep, the, the fastest combustion powered SUV, still the, the Aston Martin DBX 707, 0 to 60 in 3.1 seconds. And it's doing it with 697 horsepower. So it's doing it with less than the label red. Um, I can't remember what the price is on this right offhand. I think that I think that the DBX 707 checks in. Well, I shouldn't say that. We don't know what the label red's price is yet. So we do not know. We just know it's over 159 grand. So, so yeah, so some good information there. Jump over to motor1.com, bring up uh fastest SUVs. Um I'll I'll have to I'll have to double check the top speed because um depending on the top speed, how it ranks, our first criteria for that list is 0 to 60 and in the mm-hmm. event of a tie, we then rate it by top speed. And so many SUVs are limited to 155 miles an hour. That that's that's why we stick to the 0 to 60 because okay, if you're just going to have it electronically limited to 155, it's it's difficult. I mean, a lot of things will do 155 miles an hour these days. So, yep. um, but yeah, that's that's uh, that's the lowdown on label red. Yeah, uh, Smith, do we want to do the EPA stuff next, or do we want to keep talking about some vehicles? Where you what you, what you feeling? Let, let's how, how about we hold the EPA stuff to the end? Okay. Um, be, we'll have because, our vegetables at the end because that's kind of what be, it feels like. Because I mean, the, there's there's a fair amount there to discuss, and there's a fair amount that's that's still a bit mysterious because we're talking about a thousand page report. Yes. Um, <laughs> but but I mean, it, it's it's significant. But let's 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 talk about some more cars, Bruce. And okay, I think I think the next one is sort of a of, of a 
of an odd one. Maybe, maybe oh, our oh, listeners haven't oh, heard it's of it. Odd. Yet. <laughs> it's odd, all right. <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Force City Line, uh, which, uh, from this front image that you're looking at now on YouTube, you, uh, you can't really tell. But from this three quarter image, you can see it looks like a Mercedes G class that someone put in like a taffy puller and just like pulled it super, super, super long. Um, it's so it's, yeah. it's it's an odd one and if you're wondering what what is this this is uh, this is a car from india um it, it's a new vehicle um the, the manufacturer is force um and yeah it's called the force city line um it just debuted for india it is a four row suv seats 10 people inside um if it were to be available in the U S market, it would it sell for not. 19, which, which is not, and it won't be, it would sell for $19,000, a 10 seater SUV for $19,000. Um, and we should note that it has a 2.6 liter four cylinder engine. I assume this is a diesel judging by the output that is, I'm about to quote, but we don't it, have, it a, is a oh, diesel. Is. In fact, it is a diesel and it's sourced from Mercedes. Okay. So it, it may be, there's a little bit of Mercedes DNA. So it makes 90 horsepower. Yes, 90, nine 90 zero, horsepower. and 184 pound feet of torque. And it runs through a five speed manual gearbox and a five ride. speed it's, manual, ladder frame, body on leaf, frame. Yep, leaf springs with drum brakes in the back. Um, it is a basic people mover. Um, mm -hmm. It does have air conditioning. Um, you can get it with power windows, anti-lock brakes, um, does not have a radio. So no radio, no speakers. Um, but it was the, the reason we bring it up. It was a surprise hit um, with, with our motor one.com readers. And, yeah. and I, I say surprise because sometimes uh, and it, it generally relates to SUVs. Um, sometimes things that we don't expect just really click with our, with our audience. And we wanted to share that on rambling about cars. We wanted to share it with all the ramblers. Um, it's a very basic vehicle. It does have very boxy kind of G class look about it. albeit a stretched out one. Um, it's not a pretty vehicle. It's not an ugly vehicle. In my opinion, it, it sort of, it sort of falls in line there with, with the XM uh, except this is obviously far more functional. I mean, I think that's the best way to describe this. This yes. is a functional vehicle. There's room inside it, and it looks, uh, if, I mean, if not super comfortable, at least, uh, at least, you know, modestly comfortable for, for 10 people. Um, and it, it made me wonder, Bruce, at least here in the United States. And I know we have a lot of listeners out there around the world, um, we don't have any sort of options for just inexpensive functional transportation like this. I guess, I guess you could still get, uh, I, I think GMC still has like, like their Savannah vans right? That, uh, that with, with styling that's, that's dating back like, you know, 15, 20 years at this point uh, with, with various passenger seats in them, but you're not paying 19,000 for that. I mean, you're still no. getting a vehicle with, uh, with a fair amount of options, with a fair amount of, of uh, you know, standard equipment built into it. Is there, I mean, is there a place for just basic functional vehicles like this? I mean, is, is this, is this something that could be missing in a, in the United States provided it could pass all of the safety regulations and, and that sort of thing? I think there are a certain group of people who want a vehicle like this, certainly. So I say that as I'm scrolling through, I know uh, not too long ago we covered, I want also to make it clear, we're not like joking on this vehicle, like, oh, oh, oh no, the Indian auto and just, no, 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 not at all. What's fascinating about vehicles like this is that it's a very basic vehicle that checks all the boxes of what a vehicle should do. So in right. this case, you can load 10 people into it and it, yeah, it looks like a Mercedes G class, whatever, but it's totally functional and it does everything. It just does it in a very basic way. And what we have seen, you know, Smith, you and I have been writing about cars for a while is that there is a certain desire amongst a certain group of people for vehicles like this, that they don't necessarily want all of the amenities that they wish that yeah. they could get a very basic 
kind of vehicle. And I am searching th- as, as I am talking, I am also scrolling. And that's why you'll probably see my eyes moving because I know uh, sometime recently we covered a Nissan that was available in Japan that is very much the similar idea. And I can't remember what it's called mm-hmm. because if I could, I would have found it already. But again, it's a very basic vehicle, very inexpensive but also completely functional that, you know, it, it does what it needs to do and nothing more. And that story did gangbusters traffic for us. I think for the same reason that this story did really well for us, that there are people that kind of want, wish that they could still have that. Well, I promise you this every time a new pickup truck debuts, whether it's from an American automaker, whether it's from a Japanese automaker, Every single time, and I'm I, you say every single time, you don't say that. I'm saying it every single time a new pickup truck debuts, we will get at least one, if not several, emails sent to our our just our like our tips or just our general comments email for Motor One of somebody saying, Can't I just get like a basic two door single cab long box truck? Without without all of the without all of the extra equipment, without the you know just just the gobs of driver assist. Now, I mean, some of those really really help with safety. Um, I I don't want to say hey, let's get oh, rid of God. Those. Of course they do. There's there there are there are some huge safety benefits there. Um, but do I need to have like twelve speakers in the cab of my truck with a stereo? Uh, with apps that I can order food from. It's, it's like, I guarantee every single time a truck debuts, we will get something like that. Um, and it kind of, it kind of just pulls me back to, it pulls me back to this vehicle of let's just have a vehicle that functions has a vehicle and not a vehicle slash mobile office slash, mm-hmm. um, you know, tailgating adventure vehicle slash um you know mobile entertainment center it's th- this takes us back to to a, a, a different time and i mean this still has air conditioning it still has power windows um like abs it, like you said yeah i mean it, it doesn't have an infotainment system well okay if yeah. you just need a, if you just need a vehicle to get you and your family from you know from point a to point b I don't know. I mean, maybe there's a market for it. Um, I just want to address some. Of, oh, you're doing right. The yeah, same yeah, thing uh, I, was uh, I just I want to address some of our comments. So. Yep, jumping into some of the comments. Um, um, Eric says, "Imagine the safety regs." I mean, that would be. I mean, I I, I suspect that would be right. Certainly, certainly, yeah. certainly one of the areas to examine, especially if you look at those folks in the back in this image that I've got pulled up here. If this thing were rear ended, I would. They, they kind of very... look like the crumple zone. <laughs> unfortunately yes that would be the issue but i mean there 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 are a lot of of suvs especially smaller you know some of the smaller suvs and crossovers that are three row that just have you know two very small seats they're just about right there at the back i have no idea what's going on underneath the skin of this um right but i mean obviously there there are there are some pretty stringent safety regulations uh required for vehicles in the u.s that 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 could just make some something like this just not feasible um, and we did we did mention the price of nineteen thousand dollars. That's with current conversion rates. Um, if this were to be offered in the United States, it would probably have to sell for a higher price just because there are going to be different different regulations, different different certification things that they'll have to go through. Right. Um, and it would also but, have to be imported into the U.S., so that's going to add right. money on top of it. But yeah. It, right. You know, and for anyone out there, for our listeners who are out there, we I. I I want to have this conversation real quick is that it's always very, very tricky for us when we're writing about foreign market vehicles, when it comes to price, because you always like no country prices vehicles the same way. There are different taxes involved. There are different, you know, incentives involved. They might quote prices differently in different areas. So when whenever you are reading about a car and it's from a foreign market and you see a price just understand that we're doing a conversion there and we're doing our best but if the vehicle's not going to come to the united states it's there's a little bit of guesswork going on mm-hmm. there too there is yeah 
There is. So, I mean, something to keep in mind going forward. Um, I think, Here, I yeah. think. And then also, uh, oh. EKAG Canadian said, can you talk about the upcoming Lexus LM? So far, we oh, only yeah. have teasers about it. Um, when it debuts, I have no problem making it, you know, something to talk about on the show. But right now, we don't really know enough. I'll, I'll tell you what, I will pull up. Yeah, yeah, go, go ahead and pull up. I'm glad, I'm glad you caught, uh, I'm glad you caught the comment there. Um, uh, I mean, that's certainly something we're going to talk about when it debuts. Right. Um, Once it debuts, we'll talk about it. Right. But right now we have just, you know, shadowy mm -hmm. teasers. I, we don't have enough to be able to talk about it yet. So and we're not going to talk about it now, but we can certainly talk about it later. Right. Uh, but I yeah, mean, it's... it is the latest version of Lexus's minivan that they sell in some countries. And so, yeah. and. I think it's kind of cool in a weird way. I don't know. No, it is kind of cool in a weird way. It, I mean, it, I mean, it's one of those. I mean, like I said, version I, right there. Yeah, that's, it's, the, the current version just has this kind of. I mean, it's it's like the Lexus spindle grill that yeah. that got shot by like the you know the, like the the super duper and large O Ray or whatever you want to call it. Yeah. You know, it's so it's a Toyota High Ace. I believe mm -hmm. it's a High Ace, the van that they have. But then it's got this giant Lexus ugly as sin grill but so yeah uh but it's so, yeah, it's one is... of those where it's like it's so bad it's good right yeah it kind of is yeah it kind of is <laughs> we we so, need it, red, we need we need red trim on this this would legit be the next a-team fan yeah so <laughs> ekg canadian tune in i it'll probably be depending on when it debuts next week it'll either be next week or the following week but we will talk about the lexus lm because Absolutely. it'll kind of be like uh, the force that we were just talking about, where it'll be so weird that we kind of can't help but bring it up. Absolutely. And uh, and as we transition into our final topic of the night, let me just remind everybody. Oh, our I thought we were talking mini. Oh, okay. Our second last um, topic of tonight. We'll talk we about mini here really quick. We no, can no, we, no, we got it. We got it. Let, let's talk mini because it's a funny story. But before we talk mini, I just want to remind everybody, if you aren't catching us live, you can go back and watch us anytime you want at Motor One on YouTube. Motor One's YouTube channel, just, just Motor One on YouTube. That's all you got to do. We're in the live video section. You can catch these that go up. We're also still on every major audio streaming platform, Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, Deezer, all of the ones that you love and enjoy. We're, we're happy to still have our audio listeners. Um, and we do have email still, podcastermoto1.com. You can email us your thoughts if you don't happen to catch us live. We're happy, happy, happy to read those emails on the air. And, and our audio show, we post on Fridays. Um, yep. Yep. So the audio goes up every Friday. Um, if so, the, if for, you don't want to watch us, you can listen to us. It'll be up Fridays. Um, I mean, honestly, yeah. I don't know why people want to do either, but we really appreciate everybody that's tuning in right now. We love, we love everybody here. <laughs> we, we love everybody. So, um, speaking of love, let's give, let's give the new mini some love. Cause, Oak cause joke. mini wanted us to give the new mini some love to be yes. clear that this is the new mini Cooper that hasn't officially debuted yet. Uh, but we do have an official exterior debut, um, for images and the story behind it is just a little interesting because um, if, if you're a regular reader at motor1.com, you'll know that images, some spy photos came out um, it was just a couple weeks ago that it was caught a week before these images, I think. It yeah, it, it, caught, it caught the new Mini Cooper completely undisguised, apparently on a photo shoot in Los Angeles because it was uh, surrounded by some camera cars. Um, yeah. So I'm going to, for anyone listening, I'm going to, these are the official images that you're looking at right here. Mm -hmm. And I'm putting up the spy shots that we got and you'll immediately be able to tell because it's being followed by a camera car. <laughs> and, and in fact, it is the same car. It is the same oh. car that was captured in spy photos. Exactly the same car. Um, it's the same car, same color, same license plate. It's rare that we get, uh, that we get photos like this of a car. I mean, not even the badges are covered up. Usually, I mean, if things are about to debut, but it's still quote unquote a prototype car or a secret car, the badges are covered. And this was just completely um, out in the open. We don't know the circumstances behind it. Right. But those images went out and uh, Minnie said, well, you know what? Let's uh, let's go ahead and release some official exterior images just to present the car in a little bit better light. Um, Apparently, so Minnie was not happy with the way these photos came out. They thought it didn't you know, portray the car very well. 
So they release I mean, their own images of the car. Right. I mean, it, it's in action. Um, I mean, the spy photos are never going to be as clear as as some nice um, no, you know, set up photos. Um, it looks like they, they probably gave the car a wash, a nice wax, put it in a nice spot, gave it some some good lighting. Um, but Bruce, you have a mini in your garage right I now. Do. So well, give us, yeah, give us, yeah, give us, exactly. give us your take. Give us your take on the new mini. Well, I mean, what do you so, think? Apparently. Uh, so we discussed this in our chat because um, our managing editor, Brandon Turkus also owns a mini. So, and uh, you know, an R he has an R 53, which is the Cooper S I have an R 50, which is the regular Cooper, but basically the same vehicle. And he and I both were in praise of this. I, I feel like the front overhang is a bit long that it kind of feels like the nose got stretched out a little bit. I don't necessarily love that, but that being said, he and I were in agreement. This is the best looking three door mini since the first one from BMW, the R 50 R 53. But apparently, and I, apparently I don't, you know, follow car Twitter or stuff well enough. A lot of people don't like this car, I guess. And I don't. Un- so here, I'm going to pause this image right here because this is the image where it, it the, the nose, nose does is- look a, a little stretched. But I mean, maybe this is why. Maybe this is why Mini said, "Well, here, here are some extra photos, some official photos that we've taken that'll present it's just it in a little bit better light." The other thing is, is that we, um, uh, we also. At least for the so this vehicle, at least to my knowledge, is not coming to the United States or because this is the electric version. We are not getting the EV version in the United States. I think it's it's still a bit unclear, but um, so we we know that this has an, an electric motor driving the front wheels, at least the EV version does. And so it's surprising that the front overhang is so long because usually with EVs, you wouldn't need to do that because you know they're so they're much more compact and things like that but yeah this angle it it's not the most flattering but then when you it's look not. at it from other uh angles it's a good looking vehicle I, yeah i i've got no complaint i i agree with brandon this is the best looking since you know bmw revived the mini brand in, I mean, in my opinion but apparently people disagree commenters Come on, tell me if I'm right or wrong, because I, I, I'm happy to be told you guys disagree, but I, I like it. I mean, I, I think I think maybe some of the criticism might come in from that mouth because it is a pretty big mouth up there. It, it's a pretty big grill. That, um, and and, grill and I've doesn't splashed bother me. up it's here. The overhang. It's well, well, that, I've, I've splashed up here. This is we're now looking at one of Minnie's official images that they sent us a uh, side on from the car. I don't think the overhang looks quite as bad here, but I mean, there's, it I doesn't. mean, there's still, there, there's still noticeable overhang, but it's not quite as bad. So, I mean, maybe this is what they were talking about when they said, Hey, let's present it in a little bit better light. Um, I, yeah. I, I did see a little bit of talk, a little bit of chatter on social talking about that. Um, I mean, to me, if anything, the, the grill, but I mean, I'm everybody that listens to rambling about cars knows I'm not a fan of big grills, except apparently on weird Lexus minivans. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, when they look and, like something you could grill a steak on, you're performing. <laughs> I haven't had dinner yet. That sounds great. Um, but I mean, can we agree that Mini has become like the Porsche 911 of hot hatches? It's just, it's kind of the same style. They make, they make some changes. They come out with a new generation, but it's still kind of that same basic style, that same basic formula. And I, I think for, I, I feel like for a while, Mini, you know, people were saying, oh, it's just, you know, they need to do something different. But now it's like, no, that's if if it's working. I mean, why why rock the boat if it's working, right? Yeah. So, uh, former our former boss John Neff and I, he is a proponent of the idea that you shouldn't come up with a good design and then don't alter it, but then alter the stuff around it. So, give it a better infotainment system, give it a better powertrain, but come up with a good design and stick to it. And generally, I disagree with him. This is a case where I do agree with him. I think BMW with their Revive Mini got it right the first time, and they've been chasing that ever since. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, Chris Specht. This is somewhere between the original Comeback Mini Cooper mixed with the very first Clubman, very true to their roots, and not another BMW X1. Yeah. Yeah. I agree with that. 
Yeah, that that sounds like a pretty good assessment as well uh, to me. Totally. I uh, the more the more I, the reason I'm hesitating. The more I look at that grill, the less I like it now. But it's an I, easy. I mean, you so are gotta... you are sitting here. You are sitting here right now, seeing somebody lose interest in a vehicle because as I'm looking at that front grill a little bit more, it's like, okay. Maybe we maybe I just need to look at it from the side, or maybe I haven't looked at it enough from the front. Maybe I haven't looked at it enough altogether. I don't know. Um, yeah. I, yeah, you, you have it, a it, you have a thought that's processing, Bruce. I can I can I, I can see it. I can hear it. It's trying to find its way out. I I think it's complicated because it goes back to what you were saying that Mini has become the Porsche 911 of hatchbacks, that it has such an established aesthetic and it's kind of, you know, damned by its own popularity in a certain way that it came out in the 1960s and the design other than, you know, little tweaks here and there didn't change through the 90s. It went away and then BMW brought it back with this retro look, which was very popular at the time. It, you know, two, it came back in what, 02. So you're getting late into the new Beetle. You're well into the heyday of like the Ford Thunderbird, things like that. That at this point, overhauling what a Mini looks like is... I I do, I would it's love dangerous. to meet a, I do, yeah I it's would love to meet a right? designer to like go do that because you know you, you have to know what you're doing and I don't know who you get to do that in a certain way. Um, yeah. Well, it'll be interesting to see how it goes forward here in the future. Yep. Well, For folks. Sure. Uh, now, unfortunately, we have to eat our vegetables a little bit. Um, well, but I, and not, I say that not necessarily unfortunate. I mean, this is, I mean, this is, this is, this is big news. This is big. It news. is big news. I, yes, I am. I, I, I'm being overly harsh and especially for a story that I wrote, I guess I'm being overly harsh. <laughs> and this well, is it's... the fact mm-hmm. that uh, the environmental protection agency, they posed some, a massive overhaul to automobiles in the United States that could start as early as 2026. And I need to emphasize this, underline it, italicize it, put it in bold 44 point flashing. This is still a proposal proposal. None of this is like set in stone going to happen yet. Not yet, but it's a proposal. There is a public uh, period of comment that's going to take place. I believe May 9th and 10th, um, possibly one other day. Um, where, I mean, it'll, it'll be brought up under discussion. Uh, but I mean, the, the crux of it is basically, um, massive reduction in emissions, uh, by 2032 that could see, um, as many as 67% of new vehicles being sold, um, light duty, not, not cutting like medium duty trucks, commercial things like that. Uh, 67% of vehicles sold being electric. And Bruce, I know you were writing this up this morning. Um, the information just dropped this morning. It's it it's it's like an it's, it's like a one thousand page report. So right. we're, we're going to was... get we're going to get the cliff notes of the cliff notes here. Exactly, and that's what I want to say. This is an overview. Um, our colleagues at Inside EVs they are going to be doing a story specifically for the EV related stuff because there's mm-hmm. some interesting stuff there. Um, there are some proposals about battery durability that, that you know basically the government would mandate a certain mm-hmm. amount of battery durability. They would mandate certain like warranty stuff. So, you know. Like Smith said, there is the uh, light and medium duty document is was over 700 pages and then another several hundred pages for heavy duty vehicles like semis and commercial trucks and stuff like that. So I, I there's no way that we can present all of this to you. That That's not what we're doing. This is the 10,000 foot view of what is being proposed. So I, I need and- you to understand that. And and the takeaway, correct me if I'm wrong on this, Bruce. The takeaway is that there aren't necessarily like specific rules that saying your vehicle cannot emit this much. It's it's going it's going on like a fleet wide basis, correct? We're looking at a, a, a overall fleet wide reduction of emissions. Yeah, yes, but it's going to. 
by saying that fleet wide emissions have to re be reduced by X amount, it's going to have to affect every vehicle, every late duty vehicle in right. order to make that happen. Um, so let, let me get into some specifics here. Uh, mm, so ahead. the goal is between 2026, the 2026 number by 2032, greenhouse gas emissions would be 56% lower. Right. Um, what the EPA is saying is that would save 20 billion barrels of oil and rough somewhere between 850 billion and 1.6 trillion dollars between 2027 and 2055 though so all of the changes are by 2032 but they kind of hedge some numbers there they, yeah. they there's a bit of wonky math going on i got i got to be fair there but um what would happen is if again if this happens is that there would be mandated uh, CO2 emission reductions every year between 2026 and 2020, 2032. The biggest would happen in 2027. That'd be 18%. And then it would, you know, kind of go down from there. Um, and what the EPA is saying, based on their own research, is that in order for automakers to make this happen, they believe that 67% of light duty vehicles by 2032 would have to be EVs because these recommendations are so stringent that there's kind of no other way that an automaker could do it. Right. That and we're, and, and, and it's, and it's based on a fleet wide basis. Yes. So, I mean, if you, if you have, if you have uh, your your uh, we'll just say pickup truck that, that's still running full internal combustion, um, that's still going to be running full internal combustion or presumably hybrid in the future. But to offset that, there will have to be more just pure EVs, more, uh, you know, more yes. efficient hybrids, plug in hybrids um, right. of that nature. Um, yes. I do have it, some other I do have some other numbers here that I can that I can talk about here. Let um, me clarify one yeah, thing, because you made a really, really good point there that, yes, this does not say automakers must produce electric vehicles. There's nothing in here that says that must happen. It's just that in order to meet the regulations, essentially, they would have to essentially do it that way. There, it's mm -hmm. not a mandate that you have to produce EVs. If you could figure out some other way to do it, that's allowed. It's just that the rules are so stringent that's why they would need to be EVs. Right. Um, looking a little bit deeper here at the proposal, uh, it would see a CO2 reduction of 18% in the 2027 model year, 13% in 2028, 15% in 2029, 8% in 2030, 9% in 2031, and 11% in 2032. So, I mean, it, we're going by steps year over year here. Um, yep. And... I mean, it's, it, it's a big step. It, it's a big push. Um, and it comes at a time where we've been seeing, um, you know, some outlets question, okay, is, is this, is this metric of, of a lot of automakers that have placed on themselves being uh, mostly EV by 2030? I, I mean, there, there's some questions coming up of, of whether that's even possible. Some mm -hmm. questions of whether or not our EV infrastructure uh, will be ready to handle all of that. As far as electric vehicles themselves go, um, I, I mean, I've heard the argument, you know, quite a few times about okay, well, they can't work in the cold or they can't work here, and it's well, you know, you go get in your diesel pickup truck that you don't have plugged in with the block heater overnight, and it's probably not going to start if it's minus ten outside. Um, if you're hooked up to a trailer with your regular pickup truck or your SUV. You're not going to have nearly the the range that you would have with your gas engine because you're, you're pulling a trailer, you're pulling more mass. So the same problems that are affecting combustion engines are affecting electric vehicles too. The difference right now is okay, you can pull into a gas station and gas up in a few minutes. Um, charging stations a little bit harder to come by, obviously, and they take a little bit longer. So I think I think the question there is, will the infrastructure be ready to handle 67% new vehicles being EVs by 2032. That's, yeah. that's kind of my I, take on it. I, I think that's a fair, there, there's, there are a lot of takes that we could do. Unfortunately, 
And I wish, I guess we had the time to do, I would love to go like page by page through this because there is some really interesting stuff. Like I said, our colleagues at Inside EVs are going to be taking a look at some of the specific electric vehicle ramifications of this because it's built into there. What it, you and I were talking about this and also Brandon and I were talking about this. It's unfortunate that a document like this, a government document can't be more easily understood and i don't even necessarily consider myself a layman like you know i write about right. i've written about cars every day for over a decade i understand the industry but do you need a thousand pages to explain well, if you need a thousand pages to explain something maybe you should go back and find a better way it's, it's kind of my no take on it. I, I I think it's fine to have a thousand pages i think it's fine to go into all the details but i think there should be a summary at the beginning. You and I, when we write, the classic journalistic structure is inverted pyramid. You start at the very, very most important stuff, and then you add less important, less important, less important. You know, you you it's you know, you start at most important, go down to least important. And these documents are not set up that way at right. all. Well, well, <laughs> it has all. an has an example. It has an example. If you go over to epa.gov, which is where I'm at right now. Um, emission standards for model years 2027 and later light duty and medium duty vehicles rule summary they have a summary of the rule here and i'm going to read it to everybody right now on april 12 2023 epa announced new more ambitious proposed standards to further reduce harmful air pollutant emissions from light duty and medium duty vehicles starting with model year 2027 the proposal builds upon EPA's final standards for federal greenhouse gas emission standards for passenger cars and light trucks for model years 2023 through 2026 and leverages advances in clean car technology to unlock benefits to Americans ranging from reducing climate production to improving public health to saving drivers money through reduced fuel and maintenance cost. The proposed standards would phase in over model years 2027 through 2032. That's the rule summary. And aside from one ridiculously long run on sentence, that's, you know, at EPA, I mean, if if, if you want a little bit of help on the side, I, I mean, I'm pretty busy at Motor One. Uh, but I mean, if, if you want to toss me some cash, I'm happy to help you guys edit some stuff here. Um, that's the rule summary. And it doesn't really summarize the rule, though, does it? No, because it doesn't tell you, and this was the problem I was having when I was writing the story, especially initially, because you didn't know how much the reduction was until you right. got really deep into it. Like it, and, and I, maybe this is just us complaining as journalists or, you know, but to me, it feels like if there's someone out there that wants this information, they should be able to get it and they should be able to get it firsthand that, you know, we can report on it and we can give people stuff and uh, plenty of other outlets well, reported on this as well. Right. But it's always nice. It would be nice that just general person could go in and say, oh, the suggestion is we are reducing greenhouse gas. We are reducing things by this much at this time for this reason. And then if you want to go and read every little bit of detail, you certainly can. There's nothing. All of that yeah, it, detail it's, I mean, is it's, it's valuable. The, the detail, the detail is up there. The report is up there, but right. I mean, let's, let's make it easily acceptable to, to the general person that wants to know more. Um, and having a, a 1000 page document with information scattered about does not make it easier. And it always, it always gives me just a, a little bit of a red flag and I'm not saying there's something sketchy going on here. Just in my general experience in life in general, if you have to try to dig to find something, it's like, okay, why, why is it being made such an effort? Um, what is, you know, basically why the distraction? Why not, why not just present what you have, what we want to know? Why, why the distraction? Why the extra effort? What's going on here that that's making this much harder than it needs to be? And um, that that's 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 all I have to say about that. But I will say, but I will offer this as well. Um, and if you want to send hate mail, you can podcast or motor one dot com. You can send hate mail. You can put you can put the hate comments up too. That's OK. I, I, I'm a big boy. I, I can handle it. I am not opposed to this at all. 
No, I, no, I, no. I, I'm not. I'm not one tiny bit opposed to to more rules and regulations, but not for the reason you're probably thinking. Um, do I want to save the planet? Of course. Um, you know, my Superman costume is back here. I got my Batman costume coming. So, I, I mean, I, I can pretend to be a superhero. Um, that's, but that's not my motivation here either. Through necessity comes invention or something, something along the lines of that quote. We have, and this is another EPA report that I just talked about today that you can go to motor1.com and see. Right now, um, vehicles have never had more horsepower, more fuel economy, and lower emissions than they have right now. And the reason is the necessity, you know, necessity is the mother of invention, right? You put some rules, you put some constraints in place that forces the process along instead of just getting stagnant and just doing the same old thing. Now you're going to see new developments. You're going to see new, new technologies explored. That is going to make things better, not just from, a, a, a standpoint of emissions or fuel economy, but power. We have we have more horsepower in vehicles across the board than we've ever had. And I'm not just talking about 1,000 horsepower EVs. I'm not just talking about 1,025 horsepower Hellcats with supercharged V8s. I'm talking about a RAV4 Prime hybrid with 300 horsepower that does zero to 60 in under six seconds. Um, mainstream vehicles like that. We, we, we love to talk about the high performance stuff, but I think maybe under the radar to some extent, um, just mainstream vehicles have become faster over time. So I'm, I'm talking from a performance standpoint, not, not just necessarily an, an efficiency standpoint and come on, who doesn't want to spend less money at the gas pump? Who doesn't want to spend less money on electric bill charging up a vehicle, make it more efficient. That's fine make it more powerful. We've seen now that that can happen. It has happened because there have been rules in place that have pushed that along. Otherwise, we could all still be here tweaking carburetors and floats um, and and trying to fix the points uh, instead of having nice ignition systems. We could be we could be going out and trying to get that stupid ass choke unstuck so the car doesn't sit there running at three thousand RPMs because it's stuck open on the carburetor. So many things have improved because the issue has been pushed along. So I am just fine with with slapping some more rules in place. Let's 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 make it happen. Let's make it better. And I think this is an argument that I, I I've beaten this drum forever. All of the things that we are talking about here are for new vehicles mm -hmm. that I forget who it was. We had this big discussion in our chat about someone said that muscle cars are dead. I don't I don't remember nope. who it was. No. Nope. And that's the dumbest argument in the world, because I immediately went on Craigslist and I found a firebird, like a 90s firebird for like six grand or who knows how many Mustangs and Firebirds and Camaros and just like I, muscle cars aren't dead. And, like, and as I sit here, thousands of them. And as I sit here and talk, I have a very loud V8 Mustang sitting in the garage that I did not get a chance to drive today with it 80 degrees and sunny outside. And I'm sad because of that. Um, so, uh, hey, I, I want to make things better. I want to see things more efficient. I want to see things cleaner. I want to see things with more power. Put some rules in place to force the issue along and make things better, cleaner, more powerful. There's still going to be so, so, so many vehicles. If you aren't ready to make that leap, that's fine. There'll be older vehicles you can hold on to. There's certainly going to be parts in the parts chain for a long time to mm -hmm. keep them up, to keep them running. Um, I mean, my, my newest car right now is a 2004 model. And, uh, you know, yeah. I keep it going just fine. Um so yeah, that's my take on that. Um, J Ferrari 427 forced innovation is good. Hey, thank you for the comment. I can't believe somebody has to chew me out for my for my take on that. I oh, mean, you I'm, will. I, You'll get that, some comments. I'm sure uh, the, 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 there'll be some comments. So, hey, that's okay. Follow up in the comments at YouTube. Um, email us podcast at motor1.com. Um, 
I'm, I'm happy to hear it. But the point, I think the point is made. Yeah. Forced innovation is good. Um, I, I, I'm going to, I'll nerd out a little bit here and use, and, and use the star Wars movies as examples. Oh, okay. Now I'm curious. Where this well, <laughs> I, I mean, okay. So in the star Wars universe, like, like the, the original trilogy, four, five, and six. They're, they're, they're oh, okay. Revered. So you're talking about they're, the in-universe they're, they're, stuff, they're, stuff, not the Yeah, they're, 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 the, they're the best, right? They're the best. Um, at least Star Wars in 77. I mean, George Lucas had, he had constraints to work with, right? I, I mean, he yes. he couldn't just, he couldn't just, you know, toss everything up and say, hey, we, you know, we can just spend whatever. Had some constraints to work with. As you've come along, okay, here come the prequel the prequel trilogy yeah, is not received quite as well. Episode one. Hey, why did we have like a 40 minute pod racing scene? And I know so managing editor Brandon Turkis is going to come in and he's going to chew me out. That's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Yeah. It's, uh, but, so but, the, but the people general, younger than us love the prequels, but, but, the, 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 gen, but the general point is, okay. When you don't have these constraints to work yes. with, that's generally when the fat comes in and fat is never good. Trust me. Yeah. Fat is not good. I'm going on a diet. I just started a diet last week. Fat is not good as a writer. I mean, what's, what's the, what's the hardest part of, of our job, Bruce? It's not, it's not writing the stuff. It's editing. It's cutting everything yeah. out that, that yeah. you don't need to make it better. And yep. you do make it better. So that's, that's kind of how I, how I see this whole, this whole situation. How do you see it? Podcast motor one.com. You can email us. You can comment. Yeah. Um, no, that was a fun episode tonight that I, yeah. went better and longer than I honestly kind of anticipated. We had, I, we had a lot to talk about, man. We did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, good stuff. Um, like I said, anticipating a guest next week. I don't have them, you know, I don't have pen on paper like they're definitely going to be here, but I'm pretty sure we're going to have a guest next week. Um, and yeah, uh, not sure. Is anything popping off next week that we know about? Um, well, I, I think Shanghai I, Auto Show is happening, right? So we might have some stuff. There, there, there's that. some stuff from from Shanghai. Um, I know there's some there's some Mustang news in the pipeline that'll be coming up pretty soon. Yeah, uh, that, that I've we'll, got an we'll embargo story that I wrote today that'll debut tomorrow that I can't talk about. But um, so that so yeah, yep, we we do we do have some other things in the works. Sorry, we can't share some of the details with you right now, but um, yeah, definitely, definitely want to stay tuned. There are some things coming in the pipeline and Hey, if nothing else, you can just hear me and Bruce rambling away. Absolutely. So as always, um, good afternoon, good evening or good night. We appreciate everyone who listens, everyone who comments, everyone who sends an email, you know, uh, the thing is, is that there are an infinite ways that you could spend your time, whether it's being with your family, whether it's, you know, listening to another podcast, whether it's watching a movie, whatever it is, you decided to spend that time with us. And we really appreciate that because again, you know, there's just so many ways. So the fact that you chose us is very meaningful to us. Um, so thank you very much for that. Uh, but yeah, that'll be the show for tonight. And um, yeah, I think that's everything. So bye-bye. We'll see you, everybody. Bye-bye.